In part one of this episode, I addressed the question of what makes violent people violent. By violent people, I mean people for whom violence has become part of their persona, their way of life. The short answer is this, trauma. Trauma caused by repeatedly experiencing or observing violence, usually starting as a child or youth. Why does such trauma make otherwise nonviolent people into violent people? Because at some point, the victim of chronic violence makes the decision that this is a violent, dog-eat-dog world, and that to avoid being a victim of violence, one must become feared as more dangerous than potential abusers or attackers. In that manner, victims of violence become victimizers. The longer answer, which we explored in Part 1, is the five-stage adaptive process described by criminologist researcher Lonnie Athens as violentization. With a basic grasp of the violentization process and its symptoms, in this Part 2, we'll turn to the all-important question of how do we interrupt and even reverse the violentization process at both the individual and community levels, Violentization is like a disease, so I'll use a disease model to put things into practical perspective. We'll then explore some options and recommendations for interventions and prevention. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I do think it's fair to say that for most people, the information and perspective I'll share here will be a game-changer in their thinking about violence and about violent people. This is Justice Voices, stories that need to be told, voices that need to be heard. Welcome to Justice Voices. I'm your host, David Risley. First, a brief overview, a look at the big picture. Two key questions. Why are violent people violent? And what would it take to dramatically reduce the number of people killed or seriously injured as a result of criminal violence, including gun violence? Some key answers. Serious criminal violence is a natural result of human adaptation to violent experiences and a violent environment. Violence breeds violence. People do what they know. Hurt people hurt people. Violence is or is like an infectious disease. Trauma from experiences with violence is the primary carrier of that disease. To dramatically reduce violence, dramatically reduce and effectively treat violent trauma. High levels of serious criminal violence in high crime communities is not due to some sort of highly localized genetic mutation. It's the product of underlying conditions that absent fundamental change will continue to generate high levels of violence despite even the best policing practices. The more study there is of the root causes of serious criminal violence, the more trauma from experiencing and witnessing violence emerges as a major, if not the primary, causal factor. For perspective, consider this. A fairly recent study of high-crime Chicago neighborhoods by the Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention, which is based at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, showed that among 15- and 17-year-olds, nearly all had been exposed to some form of violence. 32% had a close friend or family member murdered. 18%, nearly one child in five, had witnessed a shooting resulting in death. In communities plagued by gun violence, a high percentage of tested children showed high levels of stress amounting to the equivalent of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, experienced by many military combat veterans, or more accurately, of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD. CPTSD is commonly encountered in people who've experienced an accumulation of traumatic experiences during childhood and is later associated with lower likelihood of employment or being married and greater likelihood of functional impairment. Such trauma changes people, and it changes their behavior. As neurologists have demonstrated from brain scans, 
it even changes their brains. As important as community and problem-solving policing are to public safety, and even if in certain high-violence neighborhoods a saturation policing strategy were used as an emergency stopgap measure to stop the killing, relying on policing to stem the tide of violence in high-crime communities without fundamental change to the underlying conditions producing violent people is like trying to stop the flow of water from a fire hose with a bucket brigade, rather than turning off the valve at its source. For every violent offender the police arrest, one or more others will take his or her place. Probably the most helpful way to frame both the problem and its solutions is through a disease paradigm. Chronic criminal violence is an infectious disease. The carrier is violent trauma. Infected people infect others. As with other infectious diseases, the only way to effectively prevent the occurrence and spread of serious criminal violence is 1. Understand its causes and the mechanisms by which it's spread. And 2. Based on that understanding, develop, deploy, and scale up cost-effective treatments and interventions to break the cycle of contagion. Like other diseases, under some conditions, criminal violence can plague communities, spreading virulently. Plagued communities become breeding grounds for violence. Because violent trauma is the carrier of the disease, effective treatment for both infected individuals and plagued communities begins with dramatically reducing the experience in those communities or by those individuals of violent trauma. Also, trauma-informed counseling and other care must be provided wherever and whenever it can be safely and effectively delivered. If avoiding the experience of violent trauma for as yet uninfected or less seriously infected members of a household or community requires removing seriously infected people from those environments, then out of necessity it should be done. When safely possible, Removal should be to an environment such as a youth hostel run by trauma-trained personnel at which anti-violence group resocialization and other trauma-informed treatment can be delivered. If it's necessary for public safety to quarantine seriously infected people, quarantine should be achieved in a safe environment conducive to effective treatment and recovery. Seriously infected people can be quarantined together in prisons, but confining infected people together in close quarters in a traditional prison makes those prisons disease incubators. Absent effective treatment, releasing seriously infected people from quarantine in prison incubators back into their communities, especially into violence-filled and thus trauma-filled communities, is irrational and irresponsible both increasing the threat to public safety and constituting a dereliction of duty to provide needed treatment to those who were forced into quarantine. At the household level, if a household becomes so malignant with violence that the only way to prevent as yet uninfected or less seriously infected members of the household from experiencing or continue to experience violent trauma is to remove them from that environment, then that should be done such as by enabling them to move to live with uninfected relatives or into the safety of a youth hostel. The most powerful element of both short-term and long-term recovery from the effects of trauma is the nurture of safe, loving, stable relationships. When such nurture is available to infected persons locally through the bonds of family and friends, Everything reasonably and safely possible should be done to avoid removing them from the households and communities in which they can experience such nurture and support. Holistic, trauma-informed treatment services are usually delivered most effectively and at the lowest cost at the local level. Therefore, local service providers, local community service organizations, local schools, and if necessary, properly designed and staffed short-term quarantine facilities 
are usually the most cost-effective means in environments for delivering effective treatment. Only in the most extreme cases with the most seriously infected people for whom effective treatment cannot be adequately or safely delivered at the local level should such people be removed from their local communities and confined for quarantine and, if possible, treatment in remote and highly expensive state prisons. I think if we keep that disease paradigm in mind, as we consider effective ways to prevent or intervene to stop serious criminal violence, the rest of what I share here will follow more or less naturally. Moreover, not only does the disease paradigm fit the reality of what causes violentization, it demonstrates the futility of trying to fight violentization through punishment, as if the antidote to the effects of trauma is to add yet another trauma. Instead, thinking about violentization in terms of a disease paradigm naturally leads to more realistic problem-solving thinking, which is what we need more of. Broadly speaking, I have come to the conclusion that the solutions to serious criminal violence fall into four buckets, trauma, jobs, incentives, and educating the public. First, trauma. As already discussed, violent trauma, especially repeated violent trauma during the formative years, is the underlying cause of most serious criminal violence. Jobs. Viable alternatives to crime in the form of lawful employment providing a living wage or the realistic hope for such employment provided by education or job training are essential to any effective crime-fighting strategy. But jobs and the education necessary to qualify for them are also essential for non-economic reasons. Absent an expectation of living beyond age 18, youth growing up in communities plagued by deadly violence have little incentive to constrain their behavior to avoid ruining their chances for such things as admission to law school or the opportunity to pursue some other career or trade. The realistic prospect of viable future employment provided by education or marketable job training provides hope for escape from present violent circumstances and a reason to avoid becoming involved in violence. Moreover, for many people, obtaining and holding a job requires a great deal of change in thought and behavior patterns. In a sense, employment and hope for employment is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Incentives Our current criminal justice system is plagued by misaligned incentives in direct conflict with desired outcomes. Misaligned incentives are also pervasive in funding for education and social service programs relating to crime reduction. Too many people have become so entrenched in current ways that they fail to even ask, much less answer the question of whether things are the way they are because that's how our current incentives are aligned. Of course they are. Things are always the way they are because that's how the incentives are aligned. So, if we want things to be different, then we need to realign incentives to match our desired outcomes. Without aligning incentives to desired outcomes, those outcomes will not happen which brings us inexorably to the next bucket, educating the public, which is what Justice Voices is all about. As I stated in the introductory episode of Justice Voices, in a political environment attempting to change public policy from the top down, starting with elected public officials, is like trying to push a rope. It's starting at the wrong end. As a practical matter, the best way to influence public policy is generally from the bottom up, starting at the grassroots level by educating the public, who will in turn tell their elected representatives what they want them to do. So let's get back to the dynamics of the process of violentization as formulated by criminologist Lonnie Athens, who studies dangerous violent people by getting inside their heads. Over the course of well over a hundred in-depth interviews, Athens identified a common pattern in all the violent offenders he interviewed, a developmental process he describes as 
violentization. Athens maintains violentization begins with brutally traumatic experiences, usually chronic in frequency, and usually during childhood and early adolescence. From there, the violentization process develops through stages as a means of physical and emotional adaptation in what is perceived by violent people as a violent dog-eat-dog world, essentially a strategy of fighting fire with fire. Successful experiences with the use of violence to come out on top in what Athens calls domination disputes to resolve who subjugates whom often leads to development of a violent persona and a reputation that's both addictive and maintainable only through further acts of violence, eventually reaching a point at which relinquishing that violent persona is both extremely difficult and potentially dangerous. Athens maintains that what he calls substantial violent criminal acts are the product of at least the first three of up to five developmental stages. First, brutalization. Multiple experiences of violent trauma, usually during childhood, often in the home, coupled with violent coaching. Second, defiance, typically first manifested in childhood or adolescence. Third, what he calls dominance engagements, testing whether the best defense is a good offense, fighting fire with fire, and if successful in winning one or more dominance disputes, than making the decision to become a violent person. Fourth, virulency. After adopting a violent persona, continuing to use violence to come out on top in dominance encounters, becoming an ultra-violent person. Athens also identified in a thankfully small percentage of those who undergo this violentization process a fifth stage, which he calls violent predation, reaching a decision to fully embrace violence as a way of life and becoming an extremely dangerous and volatile, predatory, violent person. As you'll recall from part one of this episode, and for the benefit of those who have not heard that episode, Athens describes the stages of violentization as being like a series of adjoining rooms. Quote, the stages in this process can be pictured as a series of chambers, each one having two closed doors, one marked entrance and the other marked exit. In order to get to the last chamber, one must first pass through each one of the earlier chambers. One could, however, never reach the last chamber, but could either stay locked in one of the earlier chambers or escape through one of the doors marked exit and leave the edifice altogether. Close quote. So, now let's explore some strategies for intervention to stop people and their communities from progressing along the path of violentization. Different levels of violentization of people and communities require different prevention and intervention strategies. Framed in large measure by Athens' recommendations, as well as my own observations during my career as a criminal prosecutor, as well as the experience and observations of others in whom I have confidence, I offer the following policy and implementation recommendations. At the outset, lest anyone make the mistake of thinking I advocate what some may see as a soft-on-crime approach, I most certainly do not. Quite the opposite. What I offer is hard-nosed practical thinking. I'm not afraid to admit it when a particular approach to public safety isn't working and needs rethinking, including approaches that I have myself taken in the past. On the other hand, I also don't shy away from admitting that absent better solutions to violent behavior, incapacitation of violent people through long-term incarceration is both a practical and socially responsible necessity. So let's start there, at the high end and then turn to the more hopeful and potentially fruitful topic of interventions to deal with people at the lower end of the violentization scale. At the highest and most difficult end of the violentization scale, ultraviolent and predatory violent people are so dangerous, so resistant to deviolentization, and malignant in their effect on communities 
that there's rarely, if ever, a practical alternative to incapacitation through incarceration. For them, effective rehabilitative treatment, if possible, can only be effectively and safely delivered in a secure institutional environment. Due to the nature and degree of threat they pose to the safety of others, ultraviolent and predatory violent people should continue to be confined until they've undergone a prolonged period of verifiable deviolentization. Absent that, to release ultraviolent or predatory violent people on the public would be, and is, unconscionable. As with other people in prison, to avoid either over- or under-incarceration due to subjective bias of decision-makers, release decisions should be based primarily on reasonable risk and threat assessments using verified assessment tools. Release of dangerous violent people, if justified from a public safety perspective, should be in stages, beginning while in prison with a program of progressive de-escalation of security levels based on behavior while in prison and threat assessment. As Lonnie Athens himself observes, no one for whom imprisonment is necessary should be released from prison without first qualifying for and serving a violence-free period of time in a minimum security facility. After that, for the sake of both the public and the returning citizen, Release back into the community should be gradual, in stages, under judicial supervision through adequately funded problem-solving court services in the community, and supported by sufficient housing, behavioral health, employment, and other reentry services necessary to ensure a reasonable likelihood of safe transitional success, just as with other returning citizens as they reenter the community after release from prison. So now let's turn to the lower end of the violentization scale. At that other, lower end of the scale, among those vulnerable to or exhibiting early symptoms of violentization, such as defiance or physical aggression, the emphasis should be on prevention and intervention, using incapacitation only when necessary and for the shortest time prudently and safely possible. Let's talk about multisystemic therapy, or MST. A key feature of violentization intervention at the local level should be MST, a holistic, family and community-based treatment strategy designed to make positive changes in various social systems, including homes and peer groups of people engaged in serious antisocial behaviors, especially children and adolescents. A prime example of MST in action is the Greater Bronzeville Community Action Plan being implemented in Chicago's historic Bronzeville neighborhood through a partnership between the University of Chicago's Center for Youth Violence Prevention and Bright Star Community Outreach, a faith-based community service organization delivering trauma counseling and other services to individuals, households, and even local police officers. That community action plan and related implementing programs deserve careful study and consideration for use as a model for other communities. Let's talk about the central role of schools. School personnel are most widely and often best positioned to observe and recognize early symptoms of violentization in a community's children and adolescents, such as defiance or physical aggression. Schools may also be best positioned to provide or enable access to cost-effective, scalable prevention and intervention services, especially when students' violentization is rooted in brutalization in their homes. Which brings us to the next topic, parenting education, especially for children raising children. People do what they know. So if young parents experience domestic violence to coerce submission in their own childhood homes, then they're likely to do the same as parents themselves, thereby perpetuating the cycle of trauma and violence with their own children. They need to be taught and convinced of the benefits of effective nonviolent parenting skills. Such skills can best be taught 
by respected and caring family members and members of local faith-based and other community organizations. Nonviolent parenting skills should also be taught in at least some and perhaps all schools as an element of an anti-violence component of the curriculum. Schools should be provided with incentives to deliver such anti-violence education, especially in high-crime communities where such education is far more foundational to future success as a law-abiding citizen than most traditional academic subjects. Aside from the skills themselves, the very act of teaching such nonviolent parenting lessons would have the deviolentization effect of demonstrating that domestic violence is aberrational, it's not normal, and it's unacceptable behavior, which may not otherwise be apparent to some children and adolescents based on their home experiences and primary community environment. That brings us to trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed counseling and therapy should be a key component of any anti-violent strategy, both for victims and victimizers. One example of trauma-informed counseling delivered through a faith-based community organization is that of the TURN Center, T-U-R-N, a program offered by Pastor Chris Harris and his Bright Star Community Outreach Team and constituting an element of the Greater Bronzeville Community Action Plan that I've already mentioned. A notable feature of the TURN Center program is that it's largely modeled after the program and services delivered by the Israel Trauma Center for Victims of Terrorism and War, or NATAL, N-A-T-A-L, representatives of which have trained TURN Center personnel, which is a story in itself that I hope to be able to share in a future episode. Turn Center personnel take a holistic approach to providing needed services to victims of trauma, including assessing and assisting with services needed by victims' households. As an example of their whole-of-community perspective, they've even reached out to local police and are providing trauma-informed counseling to police officers, thereby building bridges of mutual understanding and trust. Another type of intervention is what Lonnie Athens calls anti-violence group resocialization. Athens recommends such intervention for adolescents and adults in the middle stages of violentization, perhaps conducted in settings such as a youth hostel, ideally led by former violent offenders, hired due to their credibility with the target audience and trained to conduct such programs. Athens said such programs should include intensive practical training in violence avoidance and de-escalation skills, such as regularly video recording and engaging in group critiques of mock or reconstructed dominance encounters. Group members should also monitor one another's actions during real-life dominance encounters that invariably arise both within the group setting and in outside settings such as at school or in the community. Successes should be recognized and receive positive group reinforcement. Failures to avoid violence should be reviewed by the group, critiqued, and used as training exercises for learning and reinforcing nonviolent solutions to achieve better outcomes. Let's talk a little bit more about anti-violence community associations. Athens also recommends that in communities beset or threatened by violence, Each community should create a board-driven anti-violence community association to develop local strategies, coordinate community resources and efforts, and act as a community liaison with police and other resource agencies. Again, Bronzeville's Community Action Council in the Bronzeville neighborhood of Chicago is an example. I also advocate for more widespread implementation of restorative justice practices, But that's a topic for another episode, in fact, a whole series of episodes. Community policing and problem-solving policing also play a vital role in addressing the public health and public safety dangers posed by dangerous, violent people. But again, those are topics for future episodes. In the meantime, you can learn more about my views on restorative justice and policing in the anti-violence strategy paper that I posted on my personal website at david-risley.com.
Now for what is perhaps the naughtiest challenge that needs to be faced, what I call the resource riddle. We know what works to reduce crime, including violent crime. Today, unlike in years past, that's not the problem. Aside from the need for educating the public, the greatest problem today is how to pay for those solutions. It may be supposed that the solution to the resource problem is to use savings from reducing the overuse of state prisons to pay for far more effective and less costly solutions at the local level. But unfortunately, that gets the cart before the horse. Substantial reductions in our prison population and associated reductions in costs cannot be realized until we first invest in more cost-effective local solutions that reduce the number of defendants being sent to prison. In an environment of scarce public funding resources in which spending more money on one thing requires reducing funding for something else, that's the resource riddle. It's the central problem on which everything else in this or any other effective anti-violence strategy hinges. There are only two possible ways to increase needed revenue. One, raise more revenue by raising taxes, which, given our current tax burden, would be neither practical or responsible. Or, two, use evidence-based, cost-benefit analysis to identify savings that can be realized if we stop paying for programs that either don't work, do work but are unsustainable, or widely deployable because they cost too much, or are of lower priority, and instead use those savings to pay for more cost-effective programs. Regardless of the approach or combination of approaches taking to solve the resource riddle, it will take political will to make hard choices, and political will depends on a critical mass of public support, which can only be achieved by educating the public. My fourth strategy bucket, and the purpose for which Justice Voices was created. So please subscribe to this program. Hit the like button. Share it with others. Some interesting conversations with some interesting people are scheduled to be coming up. So stay with us for more stories that need to be told, voices that need to be heard.